Howdy folks, welcome back to War Thunder with the Mighty Jingles. Today I'm going to be taking a look at the two rocket powered aircraft in the game. The first one being this thing, the Ki-200, Japanese rank 17 jet fighter. And the other being the aircraft that it was based on, the German ME-163 Comet rank 18 German rocket fighter. ME-163 came first and actually existed and was operational. This thing actually flew for the first time in September 1941, but didn't enter operational service until I think 1944. And as was the case with most of the Luftwaffe's wonder weapons, there were too few of them and they were just too late. But this thing was quite unique. Well, first of all, it's the only operational rocket fighter aircraft that was used in the Second World War. Um, it had no tail. Look at that. It's just a pair of wings with a cockpit, two 30mm cannons and a rocket engine strapped to the back. Its speed and rate of climb were absolutely ridiculous, which you would expect. It was effectively a rocket. This was thing. This this was like firing a guided missile at Allied bombers, and that's pretty much exactly what it did. It would take off, rocket up to bomber altitude, shoot one of them down with its 30 mm cannons, which carried a very limited amount of ammunition, and then glide all the way back down. It would spiral all the way back down to its airbase, uh, and um, and as you can see, it didn't even have proper landing gear. There was a skid at the front and a small guide wheel at the back. So, very, very short-ranged. Um, not particularly well-armed. It did have two 30mm cannons, but it couldn't carry much ammunition for them. Um, ridiculously dangerous to fly. Now, the Japanese version of this thing, at least the German version, you know, existed was and was operational. Japan was having problems by 1944 because American B-29 bombers were finally within range and were starting to do massive bombing raids on the Japanese home islands. And the Japanese aircraft industry just didn't have anything capable of intercepting them. They were in a pretty poor state. As always, the Germans came to the rescue and they offered the Japanese the production plans, prototypes uh, and various production materials for the ME-163. Uh, the Japanese accepted, cost them 20 million Reichsmarks they loaded all the equipment and the design documents aboard two submarines and they set sail for Singapore. Luck was not with the Japanese, however. Only one of these submarines made it. Uh, one was spotted by the Allies and sunk. But most of the design documents made it back to Japan. And, and enough uh, of the design materials, the prototypes, the production assemblies, also made it back that the Japanese aviation industry could start work on trying to put these things into service. But, but that, that that was kind of where their problems really began, because the Japanese aviation industry just wasn't as advanced as it needed to be to build these things. These were cutting-edge technology in the 1940s, and they just didn't have the uh, the metallurgical expertise to to build the rocket chambers that, in order to withstand the pressure and the heat of the rocket engine being fired, and they lost lots and lots and lots of prototypes not even in the air, just doing engine tests. They lost, lots of Japanese engineers lost their lives f testing these things on the ground. In fact, the first time this thing flew, it crashed and killed the test pilot after the engine cut out after, I think, only about 30 seconds of flight. And in, indeed, by the end of the war, um, not one of these things was operational. They had six prototype airframes, a couple of engines, and, and that was pretty much it. Now, this thing's represented in the game kind of historically accurately if we can if we can actually say that even though it never flew well it never flew successfully uh, what they've done in War Thunder is that they've basically based it on the ME-163 which is what it was but they've made it not as good as the ME-163 which is what it would have been but that's a bit of a problem because the ME-163 is a pile of shit in the first place <laughs> Um, it is now, anyway. Back when I started playing War Thunder, fuel didn't matter in Arcade. And one thing that you're going to notice, if you click on the old test flight button, a full tank of fuel on the ME-163 only lasts you six minutes. If you go to the Ki-200, a full tank of fuel on the Ki-200 only lasts you four minutes. What this means, actually there's a reason for that, um, 
again, because the Japanese aircraft industry just wasn't good enough to, to build these things. They split development uh, between the army and the navy. You know, they, they each forged ahead with their own with their own uh, development teams. Um, the army managed to get, I think, uh, an airtime out of the engine of four minutes. The best the navy could do was three minutes. They've actually been quite generous, and given this thing four minutes. But what this means is that the ME163 which only has a six minute flight time has 50% more flight time than the KI-200 what are you supposed to do in four minutes in an arcade battle or, or a historical battle in, in War Thunder I mean you can get something done in four minutes in an arcade battle but in historical battles where the battlefields are absolutely bloody huge it'll take you that long just to fly to the target how are you going to land it? <laughs> you know, it's these are literally one-shot wonders in War Thunder. Now, when, as I said, when I started playing the game, fuel load didn't matter in arcade. You would never run out of fuel, and that did make these things kind of overpowered. I have to admit. I mean, I hated seeing these things because they were faster than anything else. Um, they had ridiculous climb rates, but the, but the real thing did. But the real thing could only fly for six minutes. And that... I'm not going to say that balances the ME163 and the KI200, because it doesn't. It's too much of a step in the other direction. But I, I really don't know what to suggest. But these things are useless at the moment. That and that are just a waste of money. You can't do anything with them. Consider how long it takes you to even get into combat range. Right, you start off behind your own airbase. First you have to fly to where the enemy fighters and bombers are. Then you have to line up on target. Then you get maybe two seconds of trigger time on them before you zoom past, regain altitude, get your speed back up. Oh crap, you only have a minute's time of flight left. You need to put this thing down or it's going to cost you 50,000 credits in an arcade battle. Or 126,000, or I should say, up to 50,000 credits and up to 126,000 credits to repair these things in a historical battle. The ME163, I think it's even worse. Oh, it's not. That, see, this makes no sense. <laughs> this makes no sense whatsoever. The ME163 is a rank higher and it's cheaper to repair, cheaper and faster to repair. Even though it's a rank higher and it's more capable because it gets 50% more flight time than the KR200, which is only down here at rank 17, and costs more and takes longer to repair. It makes no sense at all. Mm. Oh, actually, does it take longer? Let me see. Five days, 11 hours for the ME163, but it costs a lot more. Well, it's pretty much the same. It's still five days. So, <sighs> flying, I, would, I cannot recommend anybody buys any of these. And it's not that bad news, really, for the Germans, because you, the Germans do at least also have the ME-262, which is great. They do also have the HE-162A, which is alright. But for the Japanese, at the moment, that's it. <laughs> that's all they've got. They don't have anything higher rank than that. The next fighter they have is the very, very good Shiden Kai, or Shiden Kai, I don't know how you pronounce that. The N1K2 is really, really good. The N1K2J is, is really, really good. The A6M5 is really, really good. But have you seen the speed of these things? I mean, they're all right. They're, they're not bad. But they don't do a 1,000 kilometers per hour the way everybody else's high-level fighter aircraft do. So until they actually finish... The Japanese research tree, I it, I really don't see any point in going down here. Um, I mean, that, that's what you're to look forward to. It's garbage. It really, really is bad. It only flies for four minutes. You'll spend the first two minutes getting to within range of what you want to shoot down. One minute dogfighting it, and then... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then the last minute of your flight time, trying to get back to friendly territory so you can put the thing down. And 
and you're probably going to spend most of the final part of your approach back to the friendly airbase, empty of fuel and gliding in. And these things are ridiculously hard to land. Um, if, you, if you don't believe me, what's this? So let's just see what you actually have to go through in order to put one of these things down on the ground and try to come to the conclusion of whether or not it's practical or even worth bothering with in the first place. So we're on a test flight here over Penelou. Lining up on the runway. And our start and altitude was only around 500 feet. You'll normally be commencing your approach to an airstrip from a much higher altitude than that. So you'll have to start killing your speed much, much earlier than this. And it's at roughly this point when I realised, wait a minute, this thing doesn't have any dive brakes. It doesn't even have any flaps. There is no way you can shed speed quickly and efficiently in this aircraft. And that's going to give you serious problems when you're trying to land the thing. Well, let's try that again. Now that we know, you need to find a way of reducing your speed much, much earlier on your approach than that. The same situation, same flight model. And just note how long this takes. Managed to get down to a couple of hundred feet of altitude. Speed still over 400 kilometers per hour. The only thing you can use to slow yourself down is dropping your landing skid, but it doesn't create a lot of drag. It doesn't create nearly the same amount of drag as dropping landing gear. And I'm still going too fast. Now, I do still have rocket fuel left at this point. Most ME163 or KI200 pilots at this stage would be gliding. Their engines would have cut out. They would have no thrust. And you'd basically have crashed by now. You wouldn't be able to maintain lift. But let's just assume that we do have a little bit of fuel left. And I'm taking it around, going on the alternate landing strip, which is at a cross section to the one I just tried to land on. I have to give it some throttle there, otherwise that would have crashed if I'd been gliding. Level it out. Just a hair over 300 kilometers per hour, still frighteningly fast. Yep, still crashed it. Okay. Well, third time's the charm, I suppose. So, we know that we need to have our speed well below 300 kph. As far below 300 kph as we can go and still keep this thing stable. And that ain't going to be easy. So what I'm doing now, I've gotten as low as I dare, I've killed the engine, and I'm just doing all these wide banking turns with the gear down to try to shed as much speed as possible. And I'm using this road to sneak a bit of extra landing time. And below 300 kph still feels really fast. And we're down. St come on, brake, brake, brake. But here's the thing. You don't actually have any landing gear. Watch what happens. It rests on one wing. Now, perhaps because this is a test flight, I'm not being given the option of refueling. 
So, a quick burst of fire from the cannons, and I get the message. Yep. Yeah. I am being rearmed. Is it even possible to refuel these things in an arcade battle? Well, this isn't an arcade battle, this is a test flight, so you can't really say. But, let's say that it was possible to refuel this thing in an arcade battle. Let's say that that's what we've just done. Because I still have fuel in this thing. How are you going to take off again? <laughs> Look at this. I've got one wing dragging on the ground. As soon as I apply thrust, thrust I just start spinning in circles. <laughs> so... Oh, what are these things good for? It, it's pretty much pointless even trying to land these things. You may as well just accept that you're throwing away 50,000 credits every time you put one of these things in the air in an arcade game. Or you're throwing away 126,000 credits every time you put one of these things in the air in an historical battle. Because that is basically what you're doing. These aircraft are never going to survive the game. Y you, you are better off flying this thing until it runs out of fuel and then crashing it than even thinking of wasting time trying to land it because you'll just crash on landing and it takes so long to put one of these things down that you're never going to ever going to earn money because you're going to be using most of its flight time just trying to land the thing rather than shooting down enemy aircraft for the uh, morbidly curious amongst us, trust me, it's no better in the ME-163. Well, it is. It's not strictly true. It is slightly better in the ME-163. The ME-163 has flaps. <laughs> and it's got 50% more flight time for you to waste in trying to land. Here's me attempting to land an ME-163, again, in a test flight. This takes over two minutes. And in the ME163 test flight, you start at a more realistic altitude. This, this is the kind of altitude that you're going to be attempting to land an ME163 from. Whereas in the KI200, we only start at about three, four, five hundred feet up. So what I'm doing is I'm spiralling down. I'm killing the throttle, and I'm spiralling down to bleed off that airspeed. And there is no real way to do this quickly. There are no, certainly not in the KI-200, there are no dive brakes, there are no air brakes, it doesn't even have any flaps. The 163 is better at shedding speed when you need to, but it's still not very good at it. Slowing down quickly is not what these things were designed for, so it does kind of make sense. And there, we're finally, we're at a good speed now. We're at a good speed. Fortunately, we're actually going a little bit too slow. Or we will be by the time we come to make our final approach. Oh, well, we're on a final approach by the time we come to touch down. It's because of these bloody trees at the end of the runway. I'm higher than I want to be. I screw this up, basically. But it doesn't really matter for the purposes of demonstrating. There we go, flaps down, skids down. I try to give a little bit of thrust there, which I wouldn't have had if I'd been bringing this thing in from a glide, and I crash it. The nose started dropping, had no thrust available to pull the nose up with, and just landed too hard. But that took over two minutes. That used up more than 30% of this aircraft's operational capability just to put it down, just to crash it on the runway. Waste of time. You're far better off using what limited flight time you have in these things to shoot down enemy aircraft. Although, because you're just going to crash it anyway, and it's going to cost you a lot of money. Use what time is available from these rocket planes, because you don't have a lot of it. Use it to get kills. It's the only way you are ever going to make any money flying these things. Forget trying to land it. Just assume that every time you take one of these things in the air, you're throwing away 50,000 credits if it's an arcade battle, over 100,000 credits if it's a historical battle. In fact, don't even bother trying to take these things up in historical battles because you, you, won't, even, you won't even meet an enemy aircraft in a historical battle the size of those maps before you run out of fuel. Complete waste of time. These are arcade battle machines, and they're very, very limited 
arcade battle machines. In fact, here's a couple of arcade battles I prepared earlier. Now, I have to admit, I am I am just not a very good KI-200 or ME-163 pilot. Um, and I don't expect to be. I've, this is a press account, actually. I mean, I, you know, I've only flown these things a couple of games. Uh, and they suffer from the same kind of problem that you get with trying to fly any aircraft at this sort of level. You'll sit in the, in the queue for five minutes waiting for a game to happen. And when you do, there's barely a full team on each side. And these things, they're just not... They're just not fun to fly. They're too expensive. I mean, what do you get out of your KI-200? You get four minutes. Four minutes to smash and grab as many enemy fighters as you possibly can. Fighters, bombers, whatever. There you go. And your approach speed in these things, you have to keep your speed up. If you don't keep your speed up, you may as well just be flying a prop-driven aircraft. So you get a second and a half to two seconds of firing time on whatever target you shoot at, with your exceptionally limited ammunition load. It's just not fun. See if I can at least kill something before I run out of fuel. Ah, right. Well, he's Russian, so... I can put as many holes into that guy as I like. I'm not going to kill him, because he's made out of hardened Soviet idiom. And it takes more than 30mm cannon shells to shoot him down. My gun's reloaded. This thing is fast. You know, you've got to give credit where credit's due. It is incredibly fast. And it does accelerate very, very well. I mean, the F-86 Sabre is very, very fast, but it doesn't have the acceleration of these rocket planes. But you've got to ask yourself, I mean, you're watching this video on YouTube. Does this look interesting to you? I don't know, maybe if you like playing your big heavy American fighters, this sort of combat might actually look interesting to you. But it's, it's just not interesting to me. Oh, there we go. Almost out of fuel. Fuel warning's going off. That's it. That's what you get for your 50,000 credits. It costs to repair this thing. That's all you get. Was that worth 50,000 credits to you? Because it was not worth 50,000 credits to me. No way. And did, did, it lo did it look like I was having fun? Because I tell you, well, I, I tell you, I wasn't. This was so boring. Fly towards the enemy, pick a target, dive on him, hold down the trigger for a second and a half, zoom past him, climb to altitude, circle around, look for another target, dive on him, pull the trigger for a second to a second and a half, zoom past him, climb, oh, out of fuel, 50,000 credits please. Nah. No, sorry. I will never be buying one of these things. And there you go, out of fuel, gone. This thing, ME163, it, see it's not such a problem for the ME163 because you you don't have to fly it. You can get the HE163, you can get the ME262. There are other German aircraft, but the Japanese are screwed. This is it. This is all they get. But before we get too carried away, you have to understand that the Japanese tech tree isn't complete. And that's the reason this is all the Japanese get. They don't get anything higher than tier 17. What they do get at tier 17 is a bit of shit. That KI-200 is just not very good. But still, that's not much consolation to Japanese Air Force pilots, because that is all you get at the moment. And you get into this sort of game with Japanese aircraft, and you've got one rocket plane. 
You've got no jets. You've got one rocket plane. Rocket planes are garbage now that fuel load matters in arcade battles. And when you get that rocket plane shot down, which is never going to take, you know, when you lose that rocket plane, and it's never going to take more than four minutes for that to happen, because you can't refuel them. And even if you could refuel them, you couldn't take off in them again. You left flying planes like the N1K2J against jets. And yet, these higher, well, higher tier Japanese prop aircraft, oh, they're pretty damn good. The M1K2J, it's got four 20mm cannons, and it can turn way, way better than the KI200. And when I jumped into this thing, despite the fact that I just couldn't hit this bloody TU2S, um, I found myself actually having fun again. Um, but that's more... That's more that I just prefer dogfighting to energy fighting and boom and zoom. But I actually started, you know, earning money. <laughs> and killing things. Or at least getting assists on things. It, I like this aircraft. This is a good aircraft. Did not like the KI-200 at all. If the KI-200 could actually fly a full battle, or, or even half a full battle, I'd probably like the KI-200. I could put up with the crappy few, uh, ammunition load. And, and I don't really know what the hell Gaijin are going to do to balance the thing, because it was totally overpowered. Prior to patch 1.29, when fuel load didn't matter in arcade battles, it, that and the ME-163 were ridiculous aircraft. Totally, totally unbalanced. But they've just gone too far the other way. You, again, an aircraft that will only stay airborne for anything from four to six minutes in an arcade battle, well, any kind of battle, it's just it's just not good enough. Yay! I got a kill. There you go. <laughs> you know, ponce around in a rocket aircraft for four minutes and achieve nothing. Jump into a prop aircraft in the same game. Two assists, one kill, and I'm, ha and I'm having fun. But you have to wonder, because what are Gaijin going to do? What are they going to put in the game for the Japanese tech tree higher than rank 17 in the KI-200? The Japanese didn't have any jets. It must present a real developmental nightmare for the developers. What aircraft are they going to give the Japanese? You can have a look at their webpage and see the kind of aircraft that they're going to put in. But they're going to need to be bloody good turboprop planes to compete against ME-262s and F-86 Sabres. So we're going to have to watch with interest what they're going to do to the Japanese tech tree. Always bear in mind that we are still playing a beta test. It's not much consolation for those of you flying Japanese aircraft and looking forward to the KI-200 because you're going to be disappointed. This thing... The N1K2J is probably the pinnacle of Japanese aircraft in the game at the moment. And it's not bad, but it's just so disappointing when you... After you've unlocked this thing at rank 16, and all you have to look forward to is that turd of an aircraft at rank 17, the KI-200. So I figured, you know, if you've got to make these things work, you've got to make them work, and... You know, pretty much like like the Luftwaffe, I had to come up with tactics on how to use the ME-262 effectively because the guns only had a 650-yard range, effective range, and the thing was so fast. I've been trying to come up with tactics to use planes like the ME-163 and the KI-200 effectively. And I think, well, here I am. I mean, it's the same map. Stalingrad Air Domination Battle. I think the trick is you don't use them as your first aircraft. You need to maximise the amount of time that you're spending in the air shooting at enemy targets. And if you take them up in the first aircraft, the first minute of the game is just flying towards the enemy fighters. So my recommendation would be, if you're determined to fly these things, and if you're Japanese, you're probably going to have to. The Germans at least have the option of flying things that aren't the ME-163. Then 
you should first take to the sky in something that isn't a Ki-200 or an Me-163. Because these things have such limited flight time, you don't want to be wasting a third of it flying from the start point to where all the enemy fighters are, as they're flying from their start point. So if you fly something else, for example here I'm in a BF-109 G-10, which I quite like actually, it's, it's not bad. This is the first time I've ever flown it by the way, so don't expect great things. Um, yeah, f pick something like this, fly this first, while the enemy fighters are moving towards your team. That way as soon as this thing gets shot down, the enemy team have already come over to your side of the map, and it just minimises the amount of time you're spending burning precious rocket fuel trying to find a fight. If you jump into your Ki-200 or your Me-163 as your second aircraft. This HE-162 gave me severe problems. Mr. Camperspawn, well played. Oh, somebody on my ass. Looks like 30mm cannon fire, could be an ME-262. TA-152 there. And, uh, they're just too fast for me. Which is to be expected, I mean, one of them's a jet. Yeah, going after a... Trying to turn and go after a, a jet when he's flying the other way is a bit of a... Mo okay, you didn't see that one coming. Oh well. Uh, this is more or less what I was looking for. I'm going to put this thing down. Put it down, repair it, jump into my ME163. That's what this video is about. It's kind of worked out the way I wanted it to. Because I'd rather have shot that TA-152 down. And that looks like I timed that really well. My engine just died. Right on my final approach. But I still have enough airspeed. I should be able to glide in. I might have to land just short. Try not to, because there's a little rise in the ground there, up to the airstrip. No, I'm going to make it. It's going to be fine. Oh, I'm being targeted. Somebody sees me trying to land. Flashing red and yellow icon there on the on the radar. He's He's got me lit up. There it comes. That was a jet. He's going too fast. Hopefully, there's someone chasing him. And by the time he turns around, I'll be out of here. Since this is a press account, I've, you know, two million gold included with the account. All of my crews are aces. <laughs> I wouldn't expect yours to be at this sort of stage, but all of this press account's crews are, are, are all ace qualified. It doesn't take long to rearm or repair at all. Right, let's let's see if the 163 is any better than the Ki-200. It doesn't have to be very good to be better than the Ki-200. In fact. Strictly speaking, you could say that it's already 50% better than the Ki-200 because it can fly for 50% longer. Here's one thing I don't know. Uh, technically, it's not an afterburner, but using full throttle, emergency power, whatever you want to call it, does that burn up the fuel for these things faster and give you less flying time? I'd imagine it would. That would make sense. But I don't know. I haven't really confirmed it. I suppose it should be easy enough to test. We shall see. But here he is, Mr. Campus Born in his HE162A. This guy gave me serious problems. And I'm just wishing this bloody MIG would look. Bring this guy towards me. Stop running away from me, you fool. Two 30mm cannons. Uh, I don't know what the HE162 has. I think it has two 20mm cannons. Something like, oh, he's seen me, he's seen me, he's getting the hell out of here. Is he coming around? No, he's putting it into a climb. Now, here's the thing, I do have better climb ability than an HE-162. But when you're pulling 10 Gs, 
by putting it into a climb as tight as that and I've lost sight of him. Oh, there he is. Right mouse button, switch to your lock target, there he is. Okay. Now that bloody MiG, the MiG could not take advantage of that. I don't know what that pilot was thinking of, but he's still trying to run away. Instead of taking advantage of this, to come around, and I just can't hit this guy. Just can't hit him. He knew what he was doing, and I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to overshoot him and end up in front of his guns, so I have the superior climb potential. Use it to stay behind him, especially since I was out of ammo anyway. It doesn't take a lot to run out of ammo on these 30mm cannons. It really, really doesn't. Okay, a whole bunch of targets here. It's the best one to go for. I stay on him. He's not stupid, he's leading me towards these guys. I don't think I've hit anything. <laughs> it's just too fast. It's too damn fast. Somebody chasing after me there is never going to catch me. I'm staying on this guy's ass. I am faster than him. Not by much, but I am faster than him. If I could just hit him. Nope. Nothing. I've had to reload these... Oh, screw this. I've had to reload these bloody guns twice. I haven't hit a single thing. It's just going too fast. And I don't have a lot of fuel left. Don't have a lot of fuel left at all. And then disaster strikes. I do finally hit something. Yep, yeah, that was a friendly. Jingles you arse. <sighs> Sorry, dude. That's another one of those annoying things about the game. Um, th that guy was actually on fire, wrecked, half a second away from hitting the ground, was going to die. And the guy on the enemy team who did all that damage to him was robbed of the kill. And I got fined 6,000 credits because I hit him with a 30mm cannon shell half a second before he hit the ground. <sighs> And it's funny to note that I've actually done better in a couple of minutes of flying a prop-driven aircraft in the same game with one kill and three assists than I've done in the combined total of two excursions in rocket-propelled planes, the KI-200 and the ME-163. In fact, the only thing I've killed in the ME-163 is technically somebody on my own team. Dornier 217. Uh, I can't tell which model it is from this range, but those things are tough. Surprisingly tough. I've actually been enjoying flying them. I just got my hands on the bomber version, the, uh, the E model, as opposed to the heavy fighter version of it. And it's not bad at all. Don't forget, this ME163 has two 30mm cannons. Wait till you see them beating. The absolute beating I give to this Dornier. There you go. Most of his tail just fell off. <laughs> and I'm almost out of fuel. Uh, I'm reloading the cannons. And something weird starts happening with the nose of this plane. As it happens, it's not that bad. You'll see what I mean. Watch this. I'm corkscrewing around to try and... Because I know I don't have much time, and that Dornier is the closest thing, so I need to... I need to kill him. Look at this. Look at the way the plane's wobbling around in the nose like that. As it happened... Look at this. Look at that. Every single one of those shots hit that Dornier. All over the wings, the engines, the tailplane, everything. Is he dead? <laughs> of course not. Somebody else comes in after I do all of that to him and takes the kill. And I get... Some XP for an assist. Yeah. 
So, yeah, what's going on here? Am I just having two crappy games in the KR200 and the ME163? Would this video be any different if I'd had two really, really good games in the KI200 and the ME163? Well, maybe. But you can't argue with... Oh, there you go, out of fuel. You cannot argue with that. Flown around for six minutes, did nothing, ran out of fuel. <laughs> Game over. Is that really worth the entrance fee? Now, I don't believe it is. I really don't believe it is. And now I'm gliding in. Ironically enough, I do actually get a kill <laughs> when I've got no fuel left. Ah, so there you go. So, ME163 Comet and the KI200 Shushui. Um, they're not without their problems. And I appreciate the issues that Gaijin must be having, as it must be a nightmare to balance these things. Prior to patch 1.29, when fuel load didn't matter, these things could fly around the entire game wreaking havoc. And even if, I mean, there are aircraft in the game that are faster than these, the F-86 Sabre can do 1,050 kilometers per hour, but it can't climb as well as these things can. And it shouldn't be able to climb as well as these things can, because these things are rockets, and, and that's what they did. Patch 1.29 made your fuel load matter, and that just took things too far in the other direction. And I, I appreciate the scale of the problem that Gaijin are facing, trying to make these things well-rounded. But they've, they've gone, in my opinion anyway, too far in the other direction. Certainly, in the case of the KI-200, four minutes of flight is just ridiculous. And it's not that much better, even though it's, you know, 50% better, but six minutes of flight is just ridiculous for the ME-163. Now, it's not so bad if you're flying the Germans, because, okay, six minutes of ME-163 at a time is not great, but at least you also have the HE-162, you've got the ME-262, you've got the TA, you know, you know, there's all sorts of other aircraft you can fly. The Japanese tech tree isn't even close to being finished, and at the moment, things will get better, but at the moment... Gaijin have got a big problem with the KI-200, in, in my opinion. Because this is all that the Japanese pilots have to look forward to at the moment, and it's just not good enough. Their prop aircraft are so much more capable because you can keep flying them. And it is just not possible to break even flying these things. Every time you are going to put one of these things into battle, this KI-200 will cost you up to 50,000 credits every time you fly it. Good luck getting enough kills in this thing, in the four minutes that you get, good luck getting enough kills to actually make it worth flying the thing. Good luck with that. Let me know how you get along. I don't actually have a problem with aircraft being difficult to maintain uh, economically at, at high levels like this. Um, World of Tanks employs exactly the same model, and I don't have a problem with it whatsoever. I do firmly believe that if you've put enough time into a game to get to this sort of level, you should be encouraged to invest some money in it. Uh, World of Tanks is no different. If you want to run your tier 9 and 10 tanks in World of Tanks, even with a premium account, you, you pretty much need to also have other tanks from tier 5, 6, 7 and 8, maybe some premium tier 8 tanks, in order to finance running your tier 10s. Don't have a problem with that. It's a it's a very successful economic model. Um, uh, and here in War Thunder, I do not have a problem with high tier ranks. You know, 17, 18, 19, and 20 aircraft being expensive to maintain. Um, again, if you've invested this much, if you haven't this much fun out of the game, that you've played it that long, that you've got to that level, you should be encouraged to invest some money in it. Don't have a problem with that. But the difference is with these rocket aircraft you don't get the return on your investment because you can't fly them long enough. You fly something like the ME-262 or the F-86 or the MiG-15, you can fly the entire game if you're good enough and you don't get shot down. And you, you can get your money's worth out of those planes. It doesn't matter how good you are in a KI-200 or an ME-163, you're going to get, at the most, six minutes of game time out of it in one go. Regardless of how good you are, you are never going to run a profit on these things. They're just too expensive to use. So I, I don't really see these things as anything other than a stopgap, uh, a speed bump on the way to better things, which is fine if you're going down the German tech tree because there are better things after the ME163. At the moment, 
given the Japanese tech tree isn't even nearly finished, well, <laughs> there is nothing better than the KI-200 in the Japanese tech tree at the moment. In fact, I probably wouldn't be wrong <laughs> if, I, if I said that the better things in the Japanese tech tree are all before you get to the KI-200. So, and that's going to present some real developmental problems for Gaijin. And, and even looking at the proposed Japanese tech tree, there are no jets in there because the Japanese didn't have any. So what they're going to put in the Japanese tech tree at tiers 18, 19 and 20, I, I have no idea. And I'll be very interested in finding out. But for the moment, I couldn't possibly recommend anybody flying the KI-200. Um, in fact, even the ME-163. Those of you going down the German tech tree, when you get to the ME-163, you have to unlock it to get to the aircraft after it. But I wouldn't recommend spending the money it's going to require to put the thing into service. It's just not really worth flying. As always, folks, watch your six, and I'll catch you next time.